Let's be in a spirit of prayer. God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So I love confirmation. I love teaching confirmation and walking with young people through the process. And I know that since Dana and I taught Emily, Chloe, David, and Holly this year, a little bit of our theologies may have rubbed off on them. That became pretty clear when I asked them on the retreat what scripture they'd like for the service today. And the response was, the one about the guy who has the son who messes up and he comes home and his dad forgives him. This, of course, is the story of the prodigal son, and it's one of my favorite stories in the whole Bible. If this is the only story you remember from our year together, I'm actually okay with that. The great theologian Henry Nouwen wrote a book called The Return of the Prodigal Son, a story of homecoming, where he mused on this parable from the perspective of the younger son, the older son, and the father. And he spent a great deal of time interpreting Rembrandt's famous painting of this story. This would take several sermons to cover, both the story itself and Henry Nouwen's explanation of it. But I want to focus today for just a little bit on the younger son. In class, I explained that Jesus sets this story up for us by saying that there's a father with two sons. One you can think of as the older, more responsible son. So all you first children are kind of gloating a little bit. And the younger son, he's a little bit reckless. The younger son asks his dad for his inheritance, and he then goes to a distant place, say, the biblical equivalent of Vegas. And he blows his money on some pretty shady activities. The Bible calls it dissolute living. So maybe we church people won't blush too much and get too embarrassed by what he does in this distant sin city. Eventually, the young man is broke and starving, an outsider in a foreign land, and he decides to come home to see if his father will give him a job and a place to stay. He's not even expecting forgiveness but he does need help. The father's response, Jesus tells us, is incredible. His dad sees him while he's far off walking up the road in all his misery and shame. And his father is filled with compassion and love for this wayward son of his. He runs out to greet him. He hugs him and kisses him. His dad welcomes him home with open arms. Hopefully, none of us will mess up quite this badly in our lives. But if we do, God will be there to embrace us when we fail. This is the ultimate vision of acceptance and love. And my prayer is that this is the vision of God that stays with you in your lives. As Henry Nouwen so rightly states, this young man being embraced by the Father is no longer just one repentant sinner, but the whole of humanity returning to God. Dana and I also told you for that we don't think of confirmation as graduation. Let me say that again. Confirmation is not graduation. We better still see you in church sometimes, even though church is early on Sunday morning and you'd maybe rather sleep in. There are days when I would too. Believe me, I'm not a morning person. But church is one of the few places in my life where I have always felt this compassion of God, like we see in the story of the prodigal son, extended to me by God and by my congregation, even when I sometimes didn't consider it or appreciate it or even think that I deserved it, that love and forgiveness was there anyway. We also know, all of us, 
in this sanctuary today that you're going to change. Your priorities will change. Your beliefs will change, too. On the retreat, a few of these confirmands asked me to show them the stole I made back in the day when I got confirmed. Well, here's my stole. It's a little discolored from my many moves and being next to Lord knows what in various boxes along my journey, but I still have it. Some of the symbols I would choose all over again, while others I wouldn't. I said on Easter Sunday, and it was as true for my 15-year-old self as it is for me today, that Jesus is the center of my faith. So I made a simple cross of wood at the top of my stole to depict this reality. I always liked the passage about Jesus being the light of the world, so I made sure to include a red candle on my stole, red being the color of confirmation and the candle symbolizing the light of Christ that can penetrate the darkest places in our world and in our lives. I chose to symbolize God by depicting the all-seeing eye of God. Back then, I found it comforting, this feeling that God was everywhere, God was always watching out for me, and I thought it was pretty cool that this symbol of the all-seeing eye of God is on the back of the $1 bill. Don't pull out a dollar now. I know you want to. But it's the symbol on the back at the top of the pyramid. Look at it later. To be honest, I now find this symbol a little creepy. Too big brother. My image of God has gotten less concrete over the years, more metaphorical, far less physical. I guess I've become more comfortable with the mystery of God. And I wouldn't choose to depict God as this all-seeing eye anymore. It also reminds me too much of Saron from Lord of the Rings, but that's a whole different sermon. <laughs> To depict the Holy Spirit, I chose the symbol of the dove coming down in heavenly rays of light. This reminded me of Jesus' baptism when God declares him beloved. And I would pick this symbol again if I had to make my stole all over again today. I think of the Holy Spirit as God's presence in the world, and I appreciate the symbolic dove as a sign of peace. Of all the symbols I made, the dove makes me the happiest. My last symbol is some sort of branch. I have racked my brain to come up with what this is. Is it an olive branch to again go with the peace theme? Was it supposed to be a laurel tree branch? My name, Lauren, means laurel crowned and one of my youth leaders gave me a card about this in high school, and it has a psalm on the back, so maybe that's what it is? I don't remember what this symbol is supposed to be. I even called my parents, and they were useless. <laughs> At any rate, it's something from the natural world, and I still appreciate feeling God in nature, so I guess we'll keep it too. The next time I would be tried to be more specific and actually remember what I made. So I walked you through my stole, and most of these symbols I would keep if I made a new stole today. But the image of God in particular, I would change. And that's a pretty major symbol to change. That's a pretty big part of my theology that has changed over the years. I've had new experiences in the past decade plus that have caused me to question things that I took for granted when I was in high school. You will, too. Today, I might try to depict this scripture about the prodigal son to show how I view God. I draw one person coming home and another running out to greet him along a winding path. 
Because this image of God is what grounds my faith now. What gives me hope in moments where I feel like life is pretty tough and I'm traveling through some dark places. Of all the lessons Chloe, Holly, David, and Emily have learned, I hope that this image of God embracing humanity, sometimes in spite of ourselves, stays with you. I hope that you remember that the church isn't going anywhere. That Pilgrim Church will always be a safe place for you to land, as a place that opens its doors to those who stay put and work hard, and those who wander and get lost. We will be here to run out and greet you on the road, welcoming you home. May it be so. Amen.